barriers and, and, and feeling inadequate for the call and not knowing what God has for them. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm sure mistakes and you know, missteps are going to be made. But in the end, I know that God will be glorified because God is the one who called him there. And God will have his plans and his, um, his whole purpose for him being there fulfilled. Um, but we have a, a hard time with all of these things because we change. We don't know the answers. We become. We gain knowledge and we don't have all the answers. And, and sometimes we pretend to. I know it, as a classroom teacher, I do that a lot. Kids will ask me a question. I'll, I'll, if, if you look confident and say it fast, they believe you. You know, it's, you know just gotta, it's about like being an official in a game. If you call, if you call a foul, and they go, okay, I guess to do that, you know. Then, uh, so it's all about you know, how you present it. But we need to recognize we do have failings and we do have shortcomings and flaws, but our God doesn't. He doesn't change and he doesn't have flaws. And I think sometimes we have a hard time with some of the things he says about himself in the Bible because sometimes I think we think of him like he's like us. And he's so not like us. He's so much higher than we are. And, and, and to understand him is going to take not just this lifetime, but all of eternity. And so as we think on who he is, we need to recognize that everything that we think about and do, he's more than that and greater than that and bigger than that and more awesome than we can imagine. And if we start with that as a starting point, we can begin to grow in our knowledge of who he is. But as we do that, we also need to recognize that he is immutable. And so the first question is, what does immutable mean? I've got a little multiple choice here. What does the word immutable mean? Does it mean unquenchable? Something you can't shut off or shut up? Is it unquestionable? Does immutable mean unquestionable? Is immutable unsinkable? Or is immutable unchangeable? There it is. Un Changeable. Immutable means unchanging over time or unable to be changed. It, came from, it comes from the same word as transmutation or just mutation. Uh, back in, in the olden days, there were alchemists. They tried to change uh, lead into gold. And they tried to transmute one atom to another. That's, that's where the word change or mutagen comes from or mutation. A mutation is a genetic change. But God is immutable. He is unchanging and will never change. And this morning I want to look through the scriptures at just a few of the amazing and majestic attributes of God from his perspective and then try and tie them all together with his immutable, eternal essence. Our goal then is just to give God glory that's due him and worship him for who he is. But before we get started, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you that you've given us your Bible, that we might know you better, that we can search through the scriptures and find out who you are. And God, as we do that this morning, I pray your Holy Spirit would give us wisdom and understanding of those scriptures, that you would open them up to us, that our hearts would be filled with your spirit, and that we might not go away from here unchanged. We thank you that you love us so much. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So at first, and, and in your note sheet, again, if you're taking this, I've got two sections about, one's about who God says he is, and one's about who God says he is not. And I wanted to take scriptures that were direct quotes from God. Now, I just want to be clear here. Some of these come from Jesus, and I want you to know Jesus is God. He is God. And as we look at the scriptures and we look at who Jesus is and who God is, we're talking about the unchanging God who created the universe, who came down for us and lived a perfect life and died on the cross for our sins so that we, they might be paid for because God has the attributes of God. And we're going to look at those today. The first one is God says he's merciful. Luke 6, 36, this is Jesus talking on the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, be merciful, 
just as your father is merciful. Now, Jesus is talking about his father, but Jesus is God. Jesus knows the father intimately. He says, I and the father are one, and God is merciful. If God is merciful, that means he's perfectly merciful. That means he's completely merciful. Sometimes we think of mercy as being something that happens because we get that feeling at the time, ah, okay, all right, you, you, you cried me a river, I'm going to be merciful. My brother and I, we, you know, we tussled about a little bit when we were growing up, and he was older than me, and oh, tougher, or whatever, but um, we would play that mercy game, you know, where you grab each other and you try and bend, you know, and, and you try and do that until somebody calls for mercy, and sometimes I think we may think that God is like that that he will act if we just call out for mercy. But God exacts and gives out his mercy perfectly because he is perfectly merciful. Now, how he does that and when he does that, again, is up to God. The scriptures also show God saying that he himself is loving. Isaiah 54.10 says, For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake. Now, again, I look at this and I think, wow, because I, I was working on this all week, and it turns out that the mountains and the hills were doing some pretty good shaking over where uh, Pastor Albert was. And I, I looked at that, and, and I thought, wow, God, even in the midst of that, he puts this scripture on my heart. The hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. See, what God is trying to compare things with are things that we would normally think of as unshakable, as unmovable, like mountains and, and the whole world. But God says, no, even those can be shaken, but not my loving kindness. My loving kindness never changes. I am full and perfectly loving. God also says that he is good. In John 10, 11, Jesus says, I am the Good shepherd, not a good shepherd, but the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Completely good, completely loving, completely merciful. That's who God says he is. And God also says that he is holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And I have to admit, this idea of holiness and what that means is still something I'm grappling with. I, I, I think one of the best, or, or think, help to reveal that to me the best, is this idea of separateness, how God is so unlike us. He is holy and separate from us. Everything else in the universe has been created, and God is the one uncreated one. He is holy and greater than we can imagine. And he says, you be holy, for I am holy. And I look at that and I go, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. And he says, you be holy, for I am holy. That tells me he's going to help me with that. He's going to give me the power. I can't do that in and of myself. Myself, my holiness, my goodness is, 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 is like filthy rags. But God says, be holy, for I am holy. God is holy. When the angels talk about the attributes of God, in the scriptures, there's one overwhelming one they sing over and over again. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They recognize, even in his presence, how unlike and how set apart he is from them. And they sing that all the time. God is holy. God also says he is a jealous and consuming fire. In Deuteronomy 5, 8, and 9, it says, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4, 23 and 24 goes on to say, So watch yourselves that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make for yourselves a graven image in the form of anything against which the Lord your God has commanded you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Now that's hard teaching. 
And in fact, for that great theologian, Oprah Winfrey, this was, this was the, the part that she took issue with. It's because she doesn't understand that God is not like us. But she said, I, I could never serve a God that's a jealous God. The problem that she's having is she thinks God's jealousy is like our jealousy. See, when I get jealous, it's because of my own insecurities. It's because of my own inadequacies. I'm jealous for something that I want, but I don't have. That's not what God is talking about. God is talking about... I know that I am the greatest that has ever been. I am the uncreated one. I am the one who is due all praise and all honor and all glory. And if you follow anything else, you are following something less than that. And I will not allow you to do that because I know that will not bring you anything but heartache and pain and suffering. Why would I not want a jealous God like that who will pursue me and take me away from something like that? God says, I will not let you keep doing that. I will not let you continue serving something that's not me because I am the only one deserving of your praise. That's my God. That's what jealous God means. God is so perfect and so holy. Everything that is him, everything that is good is in him. And he's saying, I will not let you follow something less than me. How could I not serve a God like that? Why would I not want him to be jealous? If he said, oh, well, you know what? Go do your idle thing, whatever. You know, see how it turns out. God never lets go of us like that. God never stops pursuing us. He says, I'm jealous, which means he's, because he's also infinite and perfect, he loves us with a perfectly infinite jealousy, which means he will take all of whatever it takes to pull us toward himself and say, you must come back to me. Now, sometimes because of my stubborn heart, I, I go through painful things, and he allows that to happen all the time, using those things to pull me back to him but I know he pursues me with that kind of pursuit. I love that God is a jealous God and pursues me jealously. God is also righteous and just. Isaiah 51, 4 and 5 says, Pay attention to me, O my people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For a law will go forth from me, and I will set my justice for a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait for me, and for my arm they will wait expectantly. God calls himself just and righteous, and he, he uses the imagery of his arms that will judge the people. His perfect power and strength as that judgment. God is righteous, and he will judge. Thanks be to God that he allowed that judgment to go on his son, Jesus Christ. Because Ultimate justice would say that for my sin, for my rebellion against him, I should be consumed and destroyed. But he says, I am still just, and that, that justice must be served. And he sent his son to take that justice in my place. God is righteous and just. He will judge. But he sent the payment for my sin in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. God also says that he is God. Now, you go, well, of course God says he is God, but there's so much in that that we don't recognize. God says he is God. Genesis 17, 1 and 2 says, Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Now you think about that and go, no, oh, he's just telling him who he is. No, he's going and, and he's actually sealing that covenant by his name. 